from Goldman Sachs, who are going to share who are going to share their personal journeys and experience in the finance industry. So first, please let me briefly introduce our panelists. You'll hear more from them in a second. Nick Sims, Michelle Nyberg, Nick O'Halloran, and Sam Quick. We also have Catherine Grant, who's sitting in the audience today, who's been hard at work to make all of this happen. So before we properly begin, I'd just like to make an acknowledgement and pay respect to the traditional owners and custodians of a land from which I'm dialing in, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and recognize a continuing connection to the land, waters, and culture. I pay my respects to the elders of the community and extend my recognition to their ancestors who have passed and extend that respect to any First Nations people who may be here with us today. We acknowledge we are meeting on stolen land and Aboriginal sovereignty has not been ceded. So just to kick off really briefly, a little bit about Out for Australia. We're a national, completely volunteer-run organization which seeks to support and mentor LGBTQ plus professionals. Our vision is to create an Australia where every aspiring LGBTQ plus professional is confident to be their authentic self in the workplace and celebrates their diversity. Our mission is to provide visible mentors, role models, thought leadership, and targeted to support, support to aspiring LGBTQ plus professionals and strengthen the sense of community among professionals and students. OFA exists because despite improvements in the LGBTQ plus equality campaign, young professionals still find it quite difficult to come out in the workplace and are more likely than any other age cohort to hide an element about themselves from their peers. As an organization, we're most proud of our mentoring program, which has over 2000 participants since its inception. We also hold events like this with our partners, such as workshops, networking events, and panel events, where we have an opportunity to highlight role models, share experiences, and bring the community together. With all of that out of the way, I'd like to pass on to Nick Sims, Managing Director and Co-Head of Investment Banking Division at Goldman Sachs in Australia and New Zealand, to welcome the audience and give a little overview of what you'll be hearing today. Nick. Great. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate it. And hi, everyone. Thanks for, um, thanks for joining. We're really looking forward to the session as well. So on behalf of Goldman Sachs, a very warm welcome to everyone joining. Um, there's a group of us here that all do slightly different things within Goldman Sachs. So we're really hoping we can give you a snapshot of, of what the industry is like and what, what we all do. And, and you can learn a little bit more about the finance industry and, and Goldman Sachs in particular by the end of this session. Um, you know, one thing that's really important to, to me, and we'll talk about more of our, our backgrounds as we go on through the session, but really important to me and, and really important to all of us on this panel and Goldman Sachs more broadly is that, is that we do work in a diverse and inclusive environment. We're very passionate about that as an organisation and, and we try to create that culture, you know, as best as we, we possibly can. So hopefully we can explain that to you as we, as we go through the session as well. I think with the background that we are, you know, we're not blind to the fact that there is probably a reputation that finance is a hard-nosed culture with A-type male personalities, um, you know, driving each other every day. We don't think that's the reality of the industry anymore. Um, we do think we have, as I say, a very inclusive and, and diverse culture. And so we're hoping to dispel some of those myths for you today and explain what the finance industry is really like and certainly what our work environment's really like. So hopefully that comes across sort of during the course of the session. Um, for those of you that are interested in a career in finance and, and Goldman Sachs in particular, um, and if you're in your penultimate year of study, we do have some open roles for summer internships across a range of our divisions. So to the extent that you do find um, you know, this discussion interesting or you're already passionate about, about finance and would love to apply for that, you know, we'd love to see you come through that application process. If you go, to, go through our careers page, um, you're able to apply through that process. So... With that, Kevin, thanks again for having us. We're looking forward to the session and, and, and back to you. Thanks, Nick. Well, we might begin then with just a couple of self-introductions. So can we first start just to hear a little bit about each of you, a little bit about your personal journeys, as well as the role that you have at Goldman Sachs and what you've been doing over the last couple of years. Nick, do you want to start? Sure. Well, I'll start. So I um, I think you mentioned before, Kevin, but I am co-head of our investment banking business for Australia and New Zealand here at Goldman. I've been at the firm for 12 years now. Um, I was at another investment banking firm called UBS before that for, for 10 years prior to, to joining Goldman Sachs. 
Um, I've always done investment banking and primarily what that is, is a client facing business where we provide advice to, to corporates and, and governments and, um, and financial investors as well to both, to both buy and sell companies as well as raise capital. They're probably the two main functions that we do and, and hedge risk for them kind of through that process as well. Um, I've been in this, the, the role I'm currently in for the last couple of years prior to that, I ran our mergers and acquisitions advisory business um, for almost almost 10 years here. Um, I came from a telco media and technology background um, um, prior to that and, and also ran our natural resources business for a period of time as well. So um, you know, love the firm, love the job and, and, and love what I do. And hopefully I can explain a bit, a bit more about that as we go. The other thing I just wanted to add, Kevin, is um, I have been very heavily involved in, in our various diversity initiatives here at Goldman, which is a real passion of mine. And as I say, it's something that we're, we continue to work on every day in the firm. And so I'm chair of our diversity leadership group locally. Um, I also sit on our Asia Pacific diversity committee uh, and I'm regional co-head. So for the Asia Pacific region as well of our LBGTQ plus network as well. So um, you know, spend a lot of time in that in that area, and 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 as I say, looking forward to talking about that more during the course of this session. Thanks, Nick. Sam, do you want to introduce yourself? Um, sure. Yeah. So I'm Sam. Um, was born and raised in Hong Kong, and I actually moved to Sydney last year just before the COVID lockdown. Um, so I've actually spent about three years in the Goldman uh, Hong Kong office uh, doing regulatory compliance. And then um, when this job opened up, I kind of put my hand up. And uh, so the firm, you know, happily relocated me to this new role that I'm in. Um, so I cover global markets. Um, so what I do is I provide compliance coverage to the global markets division, which covers um, products like equities, uh, fixed income, currencies, and, and derivatives. Um, so I guess, you know, as part of this panel, I think we all um, are part of the GLAM committee as uh, Kevin might have alluded to earlier, and you know Michelle here can talk a little bit more about it as her role as a co-head. Um, but prior to joining GLAM, I was also part of the LGBTQ plus network back in Hong Kong, which is why I think I got pulled into this um, this this role here in Sydney, and I'm I'm very glad that you know I'm part of this you know big community and, and network, um, being able to push these values a, a little further here in Sydney as well. So. Looking forward to the conversations today. Glad to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Michelle? Hi, thanks. Hi, everyone. So I'm Michelle. I'm based in uh, the Sydney office. Um, I joined the firm back in 1997 um, for, for JB Weir and uh, Goldman Sachs acquired um, the local JB Weir business back in 2003. So I've done a number of roles. I started off in the operations division uh, in Melbourne. Um, and then I moved to Sydney in 2001 um, to lead the operations team. Um, and then for the last 10 years, I've moved to our corporate and workplace solutions division. So it's everything from facilities management to um, the corporate leases to fit outs um, and sort of managing um, client engagement for, for basically the firm, whether it's on site events, et cetera. Um, and in terms of GLAM, um, I've, I've been involved in GLAM since it started back in 2009 when the firm um, launched its diversity and inclusion um, program. Um, there was a women's network, but there was no LGBT network. Um, so there was um, a handful of us um, that were that were out, um, and we so we we um, we joined and came up with the GLAM network. I've been co-heading GLAM since um, for the last 10 years. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, Nick O'Halloran. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Hi, everyone. Um, really nice to meet you. So I sit within the investment banking division, so the division that Nick manages. I'm based in Sydney, uh, part of the natural resources team. So it's a fairly broad coverage team. Um, we work with clients in the sort of mining, oil and gas, infrastructure, chemicals, agriculture sectors. So cover sort of a lot of, um, of you know, M&A and financing activity across the Australian landscape. Um, I'm originally from Perth, so I joined the firm in Perth uh, in 2017, moved over to Sydney at the start of 2019. Um, been working in investment banking for around eight and a half years now. Uh, I worked for another bank in Perth before joining GS, uh, also with natural resources coverage. 
Uh, and I've been on the GLAM committee for Australia, New Zealand since joining GS. Um, so for you know, a little over four years now, uh, I've sort of played a, played a role on uh, helping organise a number of different events. Um, have attended out for Australia events in the past, which have always been fantastic. Um, and yeah, really looking forward to this evening's discussion. Thanks, Nick. Well, it sounds like everyone here has a whole range of experiences. Um, obviously tonight, a lot of the panelists here are students or young professionals. So I wanted to ask, when you were first starting your careers, how did you know that you wanted to work in finance? Was it something that just came to you or did your love for it develop over time? And what kind of advice would you give someone just starting out their career in finance or trying to figure out what they want to do in uni? Uh, maybe Nick, if we start with you. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, probably came to me um, somewhat organically. I, I mean, I always liked, um, you know, I was always interested in financial markets. I, I, I like sort of commerce -y type subjects that I was doing. I then did a, a commerce degree and I found that the corporate finance and the finance subjects were the ones that I really enjoyed and, and was most passionate about. There were other, there were other subjects that, you know, I got, I got through them because I kind of had to, but I didn't have the same level of passion. Whereas the, the corporate finance subjects, I, I really, really enjoyed. I then did an honours year in finance, um, having completed my, my sort of undergraduate degree and just really, really enjoyed that as well. And, you know, unpacking that theory a lot more and getting behind, behind um, you know, just the formulas and the, and the, and the different um, methodologies of finance to really understand it better. So I really enjoyed that. Um, as I say, I was intrigued and interested by financial markets. I was really interested in companies. And, and, and when I first started this job and, and on the investment banking side, as I mentioned before, our clients are mostly corporate clients and, and governments and sort of sophisticated investors. And I remember in my first couple of years of investment banking, really enjoying just getting to understand what all the companies, you know, did, what, what, how they made money, like what was the, what was the um, purpose behind what they were doing and, and what their addressable markets were and just trying to literally understand companies I found really interesting and then obviously overlaying the transactions that we do. So the M&A, the merger and acquisition transactions and the financing and capital structure work that we do over the top was even more interesting, more interesting again. So um yeah, for me, it was relatively organic, but I've always, you know, I've always really loved what I do. And, I, you know, you wouldn't do a job for as long as I've done this if you didn't. But, but yeah, just really thoroughly enjoy the journey and, and has been, have been passionate about it now for, for a long time. Thanks for sharing. Um, obviously, this is a panel discussion, but um, if anyone wants to add, maybe Sam. Sure. Um, so I think to me, uh... I, I did I did my undergraduate in, in finance um, and I also went on to do a master's degree in behavioral finance um, because I was actually quite interested in psychology, but I didn't end up majoring psychology in my undergrad because my mom told me it might be easier for me to land a job in finance, um, considering she's in the finance industry as well. But um, so I guess um, for me, if I had known that, you know, getting into the financial industry doesn't mean that you have to do finance. Like I, I probably would have gone for psychology just because, you know, it was my interest. So I think um, if, I, if I needed to provide a piece of advice, you know, if you're thinking about finance and you're not majoring in finance, you know, I think, uh, you know, do, do try to, you know, be, get in touch, um, you know, read up about it and, and, and reach out to us or, you know, uh, whichever um, division or industry you're, you're interested in because, um, I think you know we're always looking for for diversity, as as we we mentioned earlier, and I think um, we we want really diverse background and different cultures to be um, to be you know part of this firm, be it compliance, be it banking, be it you know global markets. It's always nice to have you know different perspectives. So I think um, yeah, if that you know, one piece of advice that I would give to to you know whoever's listening right now, I think you know even if it, you're not in finance or commerce, you know do give it a shot and um, see whether it's right for you. Thanks, Sam. Michelle? Yeah, I kind of just fell into finance. Um, um, kind of, yeah, kind of found me and uh, I've been, yeah, been doing it for, for a very long time and I, and I love what I do. And um, so I, and I guess what I would say is that um, 
you know, it's just that the finance industry is just so diverse and investment banking is so diverse. There's so many different divisions, whether you're on the revenue side or the non-revenue side. Um, so I think there's, you know, I, I, I don't think that there needs to be sort of um, the firms looking for cookie cutter, you know, moulds of, of people. You know, you can have any all sorts of different um, degrees. And I think, you know, diversity is um, everyone's got something to bring to the table. So, you know, I don't think that all has to be all, you know, economics and there's something for different different um, divisions and strengths that you bring to the firm. Thanks for that. Nick O'Halloran? Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Um, so, I mean, I studied law commerce at UWA in Perth. I think going through uni, there was sort of obviously a broad range of jobs that I could have um, pursued with that degree. And um, I'd probably been erring more towards becoming a lawyer eventually. It just seemed like kind of the more logical pathway. But um, you know, through my degree, I, I wanted to get a little bit of work experience doing a few different things and was, was fortunate to get an investment banking internship, um, which sort of, yeah, within a few weeks of starting that, you know, really solidified for me that that was what I wanted to do. Um, so, I mean, I would just encourage everyone to, to, you know, make the most of those opportunities that you have, especially at the undergrad level. Um, to, to get work experience and, under, you know, take on internship opportunities because it, it really is a unique opportunity in your career to go and spend a short period of time working in, a, in an industry or in a firm. Um, and, you know, I, I sort of look back on, on that that I did as a uni student and it was, you know, just a fantastic opportunity to, um, to get my foot in the door by, by that way. Oh, that all sounds really good. I, I should mention as well to, to the audience, if anyone has any questions, we have some time at the end of the session as well, just for Q&A. So please feel free to put stuff in and um, hopefully we'll be able to get you some good answers. So thanks for sharing as well, Nick. Um, that is a lot of good advice for the students on the panel. There's also a lot of diversity in the roles that each of you have. So I was wondering if you could share a little bit about the exciting projects that you have going on, the challenges you have in your role, especially now with COVID and the changing environment that we're all working in. Um, it would be really interesting just to hear a little bit about that. Perhaps we'll start with Nick Sims. Um, yeah, well, in terms of, um, again, so in terms of my business, which is in investment banking, you know we're in a we're in a fascinating time. I mean, the, the the market environment is just extremely active. So in terms of the level of mergers and acquisitions that are being announced at the moment, it's it's almost the highest we've ever seen over the course of the last few months, and that feels like it's continuing, kind of as as we speak. And and similarly in in equity capital markets and raising equity for some of our corporate clients, you know, last year was a record year for us, and and it feels like that's continued this year as well. So I would say. You know, the biggest challenge we frankly have right now in, in my business is we're just incredibly busy on a, on a range of different transactions, you know, um, and so we're just trying to make sure that we manage our, our people's time and, and manage our resources as best we possibly can. But it's, uh, I'm sure Nick, Nico Helen will attest to this, but it's just a super interesting time to be doing what we're doing. Um, there's just so much activity and so many interesting transactions. And, you know, for example, um, we, we were the other day announced as, advising a, a consortium of, of private capital investors in, in making an offer for Sydney airports, um, which is one of the biggest sort of merger and acquisition transactions that's, that's ever been announced. So that's an example of one of the things that we've been kind of recently working on. So, um, you know, that's the, bit that's, a, that's the bit that's exciting, but also the bit that's challenging in making sure that, that our people, you know, have some downtime, you know, get look after themselves whilst everyone's working really hard and, maintain their outside interests and, and passions and all of those things which we're trying to make sure we can do. And, and you know, for us, um, you know, you mentioned COVID. I think the biggest learning for what I do in, in our investment banking division, which is renowned, frankly, and again, if we're, if we're into sort of dispelling some myths today, um, you know, investment banking is very much renowned as having, you know, super long hours and no one ever sleeps and you're always sort of sitting at your desk and eating all your meals at your desk. And, and you know, there have definitely been times in, in my journey where that has been the case um, for moments in time. But I think the greatest thing that's happened out of this whole COVID experience, experience for us is, is just more flexibility. So there's no, you know, a lot of us, I'm based in Melbourne, a lot of us are working at home for, for a lot of last year. And obviously Sydney's going through this lockdown experience now, but 
Um, you know, we're doing far less travel. Um, we're doing a lot of a lot of meetings over Zoom and, and this sort of format, which is which is incredibly efficient. But importantly for all our people, I think you know they used to they used to be. Um, I still, despite the fact that we hoped that there wouldn't be, I still think that there was some element of FaceTime culture within within investment banking and within our organisation. I think COVID has has almost completely crushed that because. It doesn't really matter whether you're in the office or not in the office. People know that they can be trusted to get the job done, and 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 everyone who works for us is incredibly diligent and conscientious, and and always gets the job done in, in an incredible way. So, um, yeah, that's been a real, I think, a real culture change for us, and it's been a real win out of this whole COVID situation that people know now they can come in late, they can have appointments at home, they can, um, you know, have have dinner with their with their partner or their or their family. Um, and log back in and get what they need to get done later on if that's what they need to do and, and no one bads an eyelid whereas you know previously um, we did have a culture where, where that was that was quite different so I think it's been a real turning point for our industry which is which is great. That sounds really fantastic. Sam do you want to share some opportunities and do you find the same kind of flexibility in your division? Yeah, sure. Um, definitely. I think um, you know, GS has been great in offering flexibility, even pre-COVID times. Um, I think you know there's always an, op- um, an option to work flexibly. So I think, some, um, for example, a team member on my team, um, you know, she she she's a mother. Um, she she has an eight-year-old kid, and and so um, I think she made a request. She told the team, you know, I think what, what works best for me is a four day work week. So you know, I'm able to do that, you know, it'd be, you know, be, be great. And I think um, everyone was very supportive of her decision and that's what she's been doing um, since I think her, her, her child was born and uh, she's still doing it now and it, it works great. It works um, very well for the team as well. You know, just, you know, cause everyone's different obviously. And, you know, being able to have that option to raise um, what you need and you know what works best for for you and in terms of resiliency, I think that that's that works perfectly for her as well because otherwise it's he, the, the firm would, would have lost um, this this great um, asset who's been with the firm for, for a number of years and you know that that knowledge goes goes with her as well. Um, so I think you know in terms of flexibility, yes, um, definitely yes. I think it's probably one of the the, the top firms out there. Um, even with my experience back in Hong Kong. Um, and I think in terms of, of challenges, because um, I started, like, I think I, I got down, well, got to Sydney, and two weeks into that, I, I was faced with the lockdown. So I moved to this brand new country. I was alone. Um, I, I knew nothing about Sydney, uh, but thankfully I've had this great team. You know, we've had Zoom meetings um, uh, you know, every every two days or so, you know, just, you know, catching up, making sure that I'm talking to people. Um, I think that that really has helped with, you know, me getting through that phase, because obviously it's, it's pretty much the same for everyone, but, you know, being in this brand new country alone um, doesn't help. And along with this brand new role that I had to deal with. So I think um, everyone's been very supportive. Um, and, you know, these different networks that, that, that we could sign up to has definitely, um, uh, added to, to that, you know, uh, experience. And so, which is why, you know, I'm still here happily talking to every one of you. Oh, that sounds good. Um, no, my heart really goes out to everyone in lockdown in Melbourne. We definitely have the same experience and it's so tough, especially for people that can't visit home, can't visit families as well. So thanks for sharing that. Michelle. Yeah, um, in terms of projects, I've got two quite large projects on at the moment. We are, um, we've just re-signed our leases for our Melbourne and Sydney office. Um, and so we're doing a refurbishment uh, in Sydney and, um, and, a, and a whole new, we're taking on some new floors in, in our Melbourne 101 Collins Street um, building. So um, exciting projects, but also challenging at the same time whilst we are dealing with, with COVID um, um, with regards to, you know, to trying to keep ensure that timelines are met and that um, you know we're we're working in a live environment, so you know we need to make sure that there's no errors um, that we don't turn off the trading floor. Um, we would be very a career limiting move, um, and I guess also on the day to day operations for COVID, you know, um, part of you know building operations and you know making sure that you know we keep a, a safe um, and healthy environment for our people. So ensuring that you know we adhere to all the physical distancing guidelines and all the cleaning requirements so that's been um, a lot of stop starting over the last 18 months with various offices so that's sort of been 
you know, challenging um, times as well, but um, uh, the project side of it are very rewarding. No, that sounds great. I'll, I think a lot of businesses need to really consider what the um, changes need to be at work just to accommodate COVID as well. So thanks for sharing that as well. Um, last but not least, Nick O'Halloran. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Um, I definitely echo the comments Nick made around, you know, how busy the activity is in, in investment banking. And, you know, it's a really interesting time to work in the division and at a firm like GS. You know, within my team, Natural Resources, we are really sort of helping a lot of our clients with, with transactions that are sort of driven by big sort of um, global thematics and structural changes. And we sort of feel like we're at the forefront of you know, where the world's going and, and some of those, you know, massive changes that are happening. So an example would be, you know, energy transition. Um, you know, we've, we've advised clients on, on renewables transactions where they're looking to gain more exposure to renewable energy or perhaps they're looking to sort of exit, um, you know, sort of more carbon intensive commodities and, and sort of reposition their, their portfolio for the future. So that's sort of one example of, you know, um, being sort of playing an active role in in helping clients sort of set their businesses up for you know the world of the future. So that that's definitely an aspect that makes the job you know really interesting. Um, outside of sort of the day to day work, I think within GS, some of the opportunities I've had, um, you know, Sam touched on uh, the the affinity networks, which are obviously fantastic. Uh, beyond glam, we also have a, um, a disability network. We have a women's network. Uh, we have a, a parents and carers network. So, um, you know, there are obviously really positive things that the firm offers. Mobility is a big one as well. So, as I mentioned, I started in Perth, but then had the opportunity to come to Sydney. And the firm has a really strong culture of, of supporting mobility. And, you know, there's, there's countless examples of Australian GS team members that have made the move overseas to New York, London, you know, Hong Kong, other parts of the world, um, some of whom have then also come back. So I think the mobility side of things is, is definitely, um, you know, one of the, the, the core parts of the GS culture that people love. Um, and look, I think we, we have sort of just heaps of events and sort of speaker opportunities and learning opportunities. And within GLAM, one that we do that, that's always really popular is... Um, we have a Pride Month speaker come in. So, you know, we've had some really high profile speakers come in over the years. Uh, we had Penny Wong last year, a few years back we had Ian Thorpe. So, um, you know, those sorts of opportunities to, to sort of bring in, you know, really high profile people and, and hear their really interesting stories is something that is obviously fantastic about GS too. That all sounds really good. Thanks for sharing the that bit around all the inclusion networks as well, Nick, because I think that's one of the questions we definitely want to highlight, um, just so everyone can hear about the opportunities outside of direct work. Um, with some of these networks, such as Glam, Affinity, you were mentioning before, can you talk about how, how it's personally impacted you or uh, your time at GS? Yeah, I'm happy to. I'm happy to kick off. So, um, glam, glam, for example, um, just a personal anecdote from when I was interviewing for my role in Perth, um, and I'd met with you know a whole bunch of people from GS, and I'd been quite sort of deliberate and, and open in talking about um, you know being in a same sex relationship and my partner, and um, at the time I'd mentioned you know I'm, I'm thinking about moving to Sydney and. Um, the timing was kind of driven by, by my partner. So it sort of came up in conversation naturally. And I'd found everyone had been, you know, incredibly supportive. And, um, you know, that was obviously a really positive sign. But I think the thing that really brought it home for me was one morning I had to go into the office, um, the Perth office, quite early to um, do an interview with a few people on the East Coast. And uh, just came in and it was the only person in the office at the time was the grad in Perth and um, he brought me up and, and showed me quickly sort of you know where everyone sat in the Perth office and I saw that the team all had um, a pride lanyard sort of at the top of their monitors which you know as, as members of, um, of GLAM sort of as allies we, we issue to, um, to everyone in the network and 
you know, for me, that was just sort of a small gesture, I guess, that, um, you know, they had no idea I was coming in that day and had, had made really positive comments, obviously, in the interview process, but to kind of get that that sort of affirmation, like when they weren't expecting me to see it, that, that it's a really inclusive team and that, you know, that um, they, they genuinely do sort of believe in, in you know, being really supportive of, of diversity and that sort of thing for me was was sort of made a massive impact on um, me ultimately accepting a role. So that was just sort of, yeah, one, one personal anecdote that I wanted to share. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for sharing. Um, Nick Sims, obviously you have quite um, a large role in the GLAM network. Can you tell us about some of the proudest moments you have or more significant events that you've led as a part of the committee? Yeah, well, I think, um, I mean, first thing I would say is um, Michelle was very humble about it, but she's done an enormous job in terms of, um, you know, our organisation within Australia and New Zealand and what she's done with GLAM. And frankly, um, again, Michelle will be humble about this, but I think in, in many respects it's led, it's certainly led the region, I think, in terms of what Michelle's done with that committee. Um, but I also think, you know, in many ways it's led, led the world, actually. I mean, I think increasingly, um, you know, within Asia Pacific, you know, that certainly in Hong Kong and, and Sam will have our own experiences here, but certainly within within Hong Kong and, and other um, countries around the region, I think things have really progressed over the course of the last few years. Um, but in terms of, um, you know, my my own personal involvement and, um, and sort of the proudest moments for me, I think, you know, firstly, the fact that we do have the GLAM network, I think it, it is great for our firm. And as I say, I think we're all extremely proud of, of what that stood for and, and how that's led the, led the firm really in that, in that regard. Um, you know, one of the times that I think we all felt super proud of, of um, you know, taking a stand was, was the same sex, sex marriage vote, obviously, that went through and, Certainly as a firm, we took a very, we all took a very sort of public position in, in, in that regard as many of our clients did as well. And so, um, you know, I think that was, a, that was a fantastic time for all of us. The other, the other time that I really feel proud about the culture that we have and, and the organisation that we have is we, we do a, in fact, Sam's wearing a t her T-shirt now, but we do a Pink Friday day during, um, during our, Pride, our Pride week here and, you um, and we have and just seeing everyone in all the different offices like wearing their pink t-shirts and, and certainly when I'm based in Melbourne, but literally everyone comes in that day in their pink t-shirts and we have a morning tea or an afternoon tea with with everyone getting together and, and in a pre-COVID environment at least. We, we all took photos of everyone, you know, together in a room and, and sent that around the region and around the world. And that it's such a public support and for, and everyone gets involved and everyone does it. And um yeah, that makes me really proud about the culture about the culture that we have in the firm. Um, so that's probably yeah, they're probably the ones that really stand out for me, Kevin. That was a, that's those are great initiatives. Michelle, you have to share some of um your leadership in this area now. <laughs> that's very kind words, I think. But um I think you know, I think the success of Glam has been our allies, definitely. Um, and you know, to the to the example that Nick O'Halloran gave with the the the, um, the pride flags that are stuck on um, our, our computers was actually um, uh, an idea of my ally co-head who has since left the firm, but um, he was on the trading floor and he just came up with this idea and said, right, it was, you know, it's Pink Friday, um, let's not just do this for a whole month. We got a whole lot of rainbow um, stickers made up and they're on every you know the whole trading floor the whole banking floor is, is there's a there's a um, pride flag and and so that that visibility and you know and I guess you know and our MD allies that we have um, we wouldn't be successful without having you know the allies with the firm and the sponsorship from our leadership um, for, for us to be able to run the programs and have fantastic guest speakers like you know like the Ian Thorpe's the Casey Conway's um, and, you know, some of this um, community teamwork sessions that we've done, we've, we've held strategy days for, for Australia. Again, people, very senior people giving up their time, um, you know, to, to, to the community. But I, I guess personally to, you know, GS signing the public um, petition against, you know, for marriage equality, that certainly was um, a very proud moment for me personally and for, you know, for the rest of the GLAM, the GLAM team, I'm sure. Thanks for sharing. And um, how did you personally become involved in the GLAM network? Was it just organically? How did you hear about it? 
Sure. Um, so back in 2009, um, Ms. Goldman Sachs, JB Weir, they were launching their um, diversity and inclusion um, program. Um, and there was um, a female um, uh, senior MD um, who came out on video saying that she was, you know, the only woman on the trading floor and, um, um, and that she was gay. And um, I wasn't out. And I thought I was the only gay, gay person in the organisation. And um, so, you know, I, I reached out to her and, you know, said how inspiring and, and how, you know, that took a lot of courage. We had coffee and um, she said that she knew a couple of other people that were gay. And so we um, put together a business plan and we went to our CEO and said, um, how about we, you know, we've, you've just launched this d and um, you know, program. Can we have a, a gay and lesbian network? And he's been very supportive and gave us the budget and he's given us a lot of, again, talking about allies and, and, and you know, Nick and Simon have given a lot of, lot of time um, to us. So that was back in 2009. Oh, that's great. That's such an amazing way for this to all have kicked off. Um, Sam, can you share a little bit about your personal experiences and having been in GLAM in Hong Kong as well as Australia, what are the main differences? What do you see as um, any competition between the two regions? <laughs> um, sure, yeah. Uh, so I think, you know, first of all, I think GS does put in a lot of resources um, to back to back up um, diversity and inclusion, just to make sure you know we're visible. Um, so as you can see, this pink T-shirt that that I'm wearing. Um, so once you join GS, I think comes I think I believe it's in, in one day in November, a Friday in November, where everyone in firm globally wears a pink T-shirt. I think this idea basically came from um, this uh, LGBT steering committee member back in Hong Kong. So one day he thinks you know he thought you know we should do something more visible. And so he brought up this idea, let's all wear pink. And this got formalized at some point and this became this official pink t-shirt. And I think just before I moved to Sydney the year before that, um, we actually went out and lobbied other firms to do the same as well. So I think that Friday, like over the 60 firms in Hong Kong at least, so you know, international firms, they all came, you know, went to the CBD, <laughs> wearing pink. So it was, it was very vis visible um, down in, in the central district in, in Hong Kong. And so uh, at that point, you know, I was you know, thinking to myself, this really is a huge impact because it really does raise, you know, um, awareness in Hong Kong where, you know, a couple of years back, this was sort of a taboo and, you know, people don't really talk about it. I didn't talk about it in my old job because, you know, people just weren't ready to have those conversations. But you know, when I personally moved to GS Hong Kong, um, you know, I think people were very understanding. They were very open about it. You know, if whenever, if you, know, if, if you feel comfortable, like, and if you're willing to share, you know, people would have really amazing stories to share with you as well. So I've had conversations with, with people, you know, who are really senior, very candid conversations, very encouraging, you know. Um, so I think being part of GS, I think the best part of it was, you know, not having to create this sort of, sort of fake persona. You know, I can bring my true self to work every day and not having to worry about, you know, telling lies and, you know, hiding, you know, a certain part of me. Um, so I think, you know, that that really, you know, removes that extra layer of stress, which I don't think is needed, which is why, you know, I was really glad that I, I moved to GS and um, especially in, in Sydney, you know, this this is has been a lot more easy for me um, as compared to Hong Kong, you know, where, you know, all the family taboos and, and culture um, is still like sort of stigmatized. So um, yeah, I think that's my personal experience essentially. No, oh, thanks for sharing. It's really, really great to hear. Um... I think what we might do is actually move on because we have two questions in the Q&A that I just want to make sure we do get to. Um, the first one is how much, oh, sorry, how does one best highlight the diversity they can bring to IB firms without trying to push it? Should one reach out to GLAM members for coffee chats, et cetera? And this can go to anyone if anybody wants to answer first. Sorry, Kevin. Was that within was, was that within the context of apply, applying for a role within Goldman Sachs, or was that once you're sort of at the firm? What how would you or, or both? I think it'd be great great to share both for those yeah, that okay. are interested in getting into the firm, those that are already at the firm, but yeah. I'm sure. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, look, certainly as we, I mean, look, we obviously get a lot of applications, um, you know, that, that, that come through and there's definitely a large element of what we look for. And I think, you know, Sam, Michelle and Nick have all mentioned this is we do want diverse people with diverse backgrounds and diverse experiences coming into the firm. There's no doubt that, you know, we'll, we'll have a better, we'll be a better place to work, a, a, a better culture within the firm, but frankly, we'll also deliver, um, you know, more thoughtful, um, diverse advice for our clients and, and services for our clients if, if we have that, that group of people working for us. And so um, in terms of applications, I would be, you know, as forthcoming as you feel comfortable in terms of your background and your diversity of experiences. And, and um, absolutely, I would, be, I would be absolutely highlighting that and, and, and being as open and, as I say, transparent as you feel comfortable being in, in that regard. Um, you know, once you join the firm and, you know, everyone on this panel will have their own experience with this and, 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 can, and can talk to that. But, um, you know, some people, I think, feel immediately comfortable in the environment and, and are confident enough in the environment to talk openly about, about their, their backgrounds and, and who they are. And, and, um, and some people, I think, take longer to come out of their shell, but that's fine, you know, either way. I mean, I think what we want to make sure is that, we have, and, and Sam mentioned this before, but we have a culture where people really feel like they can be their true selves, they can be authentic, you know, they come to work and it's a safe environment for them. Um, that's absolutely what we're, we're passionately trying to create um, and, and we and now believe that's a culture that we have, but it's absolutely the culture that we, we're aiming to have. And, and whether that's there for people, you know, immediately wanting to reach out to the GLAM network, for example, and we'd love for people to do that or, or whether people feel like they, you know, they want to, grow into that then either way is totally fine with us we just want to make sure we've got the culture and the infrastructure and, and people feel really safe and, and comfortable coming to, to work at Goldman Sachs no, but thanks. I don't know whether I don't know whether anyone else on the panel wants to, to add their own experiences to that no I think that that's that's um, yeah, absolutely it all makes sense. And, and uh, maybe just a plug for um, our HCM team, Catherine Grant, if um, anyone is interested um, to read in applying, that, that they reach also can reach out to Catherine Grant. Yeah, good point. Thanks both. That's really good. Um, and I think that was actually in the context of applying. We've got a second answer to that one. So thanks for sharing both. Um, this one might be good for you, Nico Halloran. So there's a question here. How much steam do you think the M&A boom has, has? And do you see Melbourne growing competitively or should one consider moving to Sydney? Yeah, sure. Um, happy to have a crack. And maybe Nick, Nick Sims should uh, feel free to jump in as well. But um, look, I think that... Um, a lot of the a lot of the M and A activity that we're seeing at the moment is um, apologies is is definitely sort of um, a bit of pent up demand from last year being a bit of a quieter year and you know there's a lot of trades that maybe would have happened last year that are, are sort of probably more likely to happen this year. Um, I think as well coming out of COVID, there's definitely been a, a sort of a change in the way that that companies are thinking about M&A. So, um, you know, to, to give you an example, um, if, you're in, if you're in the real estate sector and, and you've got investments across different um, sub-asset classes, you might be looking at sort of getting, getting sort of out of some of your office retail and moving more into your industrial retail, uh, in, industrial um, real estate, given the benefits from growth in e-commerce. And, and those trends have sort of accelerated you know, rapidly over the last 12 months. So that would be kind of one, one example. Um, you know, I think probably another driver as well is that the outlook for the global economy has just improved very rapidly coming out of COVID. And that's obviously then um, getting companies to, to position to sort of gain exposure to that growth. You know, interest rates are super low. So there's just, you know, an enormous amount of capital available um, and shareholders generally supportive of growth and M&A. So, I think there's sort of a there's a range of different um, structural and cyclical drivers, you know, that that sort of would indicate that it's going to last for at least the next few years. Um, in terms of sort of the Sydney versus Melbourne question, um, 
I mean, I, I think sort of with the benefit of working from home and, and sort of doing things like Zoom um, and, and certainly, you know, Nick should comment, but the firm probably um, is, is supportive of people being in Sydney or Melbourne. And, and I don't know that that being in one, one city or the other would necessarily drive um, sort of decisions on, on recruitment and that sort of thing. And um, I don't know, Nick, maybe, maybe jump in on, on that one if you had any views. Yeah, no, well said, Nick. I agree. I mean, I think we're, you know, we're trying to hire the best talent we can across the country. So whether that's in in Melbourne or Sydney, um, we have a we have a smaller office in Perth as well as Nick mentioned, um, and we have an office in Auckland, in, in New Zealand, in, as part of the region as well. But um, we're ambivalent as long as we're we're getting the you know the best the best and most diverse talent. So um, yeah, fantastic. I think that definitely answers the question. Um, one for you, Sam and Michelle. So there's a question here tonight. You've talked a lot about visible allies. How does Goldman work to bring allies along the journey? I think you can interpret that one however you like, but be great well, we actually, Yeah, we, well, we actually have an MD ally program. Um, and um, so it, we, it, it's across, it's across um, the APAC, well, it's globally actually. Um, so we provide um, training to our MDLIs. We also offer reverse mentoring, um, and and we don't it usually it's it's usually you know, MD, our MDs are actually putting their hands up to be our allies. They're sort of not being not being tapped. So that, it's a program that um, was implemented um, some time ago. It's been it's been um, been around for a number of years now. Yeah, I would just I would think that you know we don't go around forcing people to become you know, like, come, they come in naturally like you know we do our plugs but I think they they like most of them you know just put their hands up seeing you know they they want to be part of this um, great network and you know they want to be supportive and and they they want to be visible as well. So. That's great. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the um, reverse mentoring program and some of these initiatives as well, just for those that aren't aware of how it works. Yeah, so um, so with, with the with our LGBT networks or the GLAM network, we have an ex-co committee. Um, and so we actually pair um, an LGBT member or a member of the committee, um, we pair them up with, a, with an MD within, uh, within the business. And um, we tend to, um, we do provide an, annual training um, and just also we just sit down and have a cup of coffee and just talk about, um, you know, any issues that are out there um, we also um, glam provides a bi-monthly um, newsletter and we just put tips out there of you know articles that are there things to watch on netflix um, so it's um it's uh it, it, it's and it's good it's good because for the junior population they get exposure to a senior member of, of the firm as well so it's um it works works both ways i don't know nick if there's anything I was going to say I've been a beneficiary of the reverse mentoring program, but it's it's great. Like it's great. You, you know, you get to spend time with somebody who you may not have otherwise spent that much time for. But um, you know, for someone like me, I get to ask all the dumb questions and I get some. I get educated sort of on the way through, which has been a fantastic experience for me. And just understanding, you know, in a far more um, detailed way, I think how people, you know, feel about. Um, about the workplace and and some of the micro behaviours and and things that happen that you don't realise are having an impact on people that that really are and so for me that's been a real education and kind of learning experience um, and and I've learned a lot through the reverse mentoring pro program in that regard. We've also actually, which I should have mentioned earlier, we've just been doing some inclusion sessions across the region, actually focusing on these sort of micro behaviours that people in meetings or client settings or other situations don't realise they're impacting the people around them. And they've been some really great sessions, actually. I've, I've posted a couple of them where, um, you know, people in the, in the forum have given their own personal experiences of where they felt uncomfortable or, or where they haven't felt like they're being heard. Um, and it's been great to sort of bring those out and people have been really open and engaging in, in what some of those, their experiences have been and, and the impact it has on them 
when those situations happen. And again, I'm, you, you sort of talk about the moments that we're most proud of. Like for me, to, to be able to have a session like that where people feel really comfortable and open talking about that and we can all take learnings and experiences away, that's a, it's, it's great that we can do that. So um, that's just another example, I think, of the sorts of things we're trying to do. Yeah, no, the micro the microaggression session that I sat in was fantastic. Um, and I think the interesting thing was we, we went around the room in our session and pretty much everyone in the room was able to share an experience of, of a microaggression they mm. experienced. And I think that, um, you know, the world's obviously come a, a long way and it would be very rare to encounter sort of, you know, really sort of blatant, you know, homophobic comments these days in the workplace. But when you hear the microaggressions, I think that, you know, those sorts of examples is definitely the sort of thing that is probably, you know, the next frontier in, in just really building people's awareness around, you know, being being so thoughtful and, and careful in the, the language that you use and, and not sort of, you know, um, making assumptions and things about people or, um, you know, just, just being, I think it's that awareness was the, was the takeaway for me and um, being mindful of, you know, different people's experiences and backgrounds and how they might interpret things. Fantastic. Um, okay, moving on. Another question here. We've got someone from Goldman Sachs. I am a grad in the M&A tax role, but have found myself more interested in the finance brackets IB side. What recommendations would you give to jump across into an investment bank? Apologies, not GS. I'm a grad in the M&A tax role at another firm. Sorry. I've got it wrong. Do you want me to, oh, I can have a go. Um, I mean, I would say, um, you know, first things first, like let let somebody know that that's what you're interested in doing. I mean, if it's certainly, I've found within Goldman Sachs and I would say the finance industry more broadly, um, and Michelle kind of mentioned this before as well, but there are lots of different roles you can do within the finance industry and within a firm like Goldman Sachs, and I'm sure within whatever, whatever firm that, that question's come from, um, there are lots of different roles you, you can you can have and, and take, and so I would and and certainly our firm encourages mobility. Like we we love the fact that people move around geographies or move around divisions and get different experiences within the firm. We'd much rather them stay happy and engaged and motivated within Goldman Sachs than go off somewhere else because they didn't think they had that opportunity. So as a manager of a lot of people myself, I would much rather somebody come and tell me that they're interested in doing something else and, and, and having that discussion in a mature way and understanding what their passion is and then helping them to try and get to that place rather than them thinking that they can't have that discussion. And, and as I say, go and seek, seek a job kind of somewhere else, which is absolute worst case scenario for us. So um, whoever that person is, I would say, you know, have the, have the courage to, to, to speak to people around you or speak to your manager around what your aspirations are. Um, yeah. The other thing I would probably say is, it probably would be a good thing to have a few coffees with some of the people in that investment banking side within the firm that you're working just to try and understand a bit more about the team and the culture and, and what they do and, and where you may fit into that so you, so you feel like you're as fully educated as you can be on what that opportunity looks looks like um, just to make sure it's you know definitely the thing that, that, that you want to do next but um, yeah, my main thing would be, you know, go and have the conversation. Like you, I'd imagine that the firm will be would be more than happy for you to to, to move around. Fantastic. Okay. Um, another question just come through from Samantha. Could you share more about how you promote equality and LGBTQ plus inclusion with client groups and the industry more broadly? to anyone. Michelle, do you want to say that? Sure. I think from, um, from a client perspective, um, from what we do with, within GLAM, so we talked about our Pink Friday, um, which we, we, we have actually extended out to clients now. We also host an annual Q night um, uh, once, once a year. I think, we, I think we're, this year will be our seventh or eighth. Um, so we... We have a team, all of our competitors. Um, we take a table and we um, have a charity group that we that we raise money for, um, and we're also very much involved with um, Pride in Finance, which I'm sure a lot of you are aware of as well. Which which we get involved with in, in you know promoting 
um, our, our relevant, you know, LGBTQ plus networks. Fantastic. Okay. Um, not too much time left. Maybe one last quick question. We've heard a lot about all the initiatives and the kind of work that GS is doing to make sure the workplace is more diverse. Where do you see, what, what's the next step in terms of these programs? Um, what's GS looking at over the next five, 10 years? Or where do you see this going for a lot of, um, lot of business um, companies in the finance industry? What's the next step to make things more inclusive for everyone? I don't I'm happy to I'm happy to go first and others, you know, others can step in. I think what um well certainly I feel within our firm and, and within Goldman Sachs in the region, I think we've well and well and truly sort of crossed that first frontier of recognizing that um, you know, we need to be. Um, you know, very much visible in terms of creating an environment that that people feel included and is a diverse environment. And people have mentioned, you know, on this panel, the little things that people do to to to, to visibly show that. Um, but one thing, you know, as a, as a as an MD ally and, and the various views that I've said on the the one thing that I've probably really learned in the last couple of years, even from my own education and development, is it's it's not enough for me just to you know, know that I don't have those biases or, or I personally am horrified at the thought of thinking that someone could be coming to work every day and, as I said earlier, not feeling safe and, in, and included and, and that's just a horrible experience for anyone. So I, I've always thought that, but for me to, to overtly show that to people that I'm passionate about that and, and um, be really visible about that has been a, an education for me and I feel like um, for lots of our allies within the firm here, for me, that's the next frontier, like not only, because uh, I think most people absolutely feel that way, but you, you have to do more than that, I think, to create the culture that, that we want to create. So I think that's one ele element of it. I think the other element that, that we were just talking about and Nick, Nick highlighted as well uh, are these sort of micro behaviours um, that we need to that we need to keep working on. And that's, that, that's right across, um, you know, all different environments. Um, and, and then, there's, then I think there's two elements to that as well. I think there's then the, one is the element of the internal culture and the internal um, micro behaviours that we need to make sure that people are aware about. And I think Nick's example of, of having awareness of that is exactly right. We need to be very aware of, of what we're saying and the behaviours and, and, and being inclusive you know, every day that we come to the office. Um, but the second element for us with that is actually with our clients as well. And, and we, we've just mentioned some of the things that we're doing with our clients, but I actually think we, we have a role to play in the industry and, and certainly within Goldman Sachs of helping educate our clients as well. And talking about a couple of moments where I've been most proud of the firm and the culture that we have, like there have been a couple of client situations where um, there's been some comments made or behaviours that are not the stamp, you know, not what we would accept within our firm, and we've actually called those out to the client. Which, again, ten years ago, I don't think we would have done that. Um, but today, we're saying, hang on, like we don't. If that's if that's how you're going to speak to either your own people or, or our people, frankly, you know, we don't want to work with you. Um, and so that you know, that's a big, that's a huge step for a commercial firm like ours to get to that point. But but you know, led by our CEO David Solomon, who's very visible and passionate on all these topics, and and Bentley DeBayer, who's our actually an Aussie, an Aussie who's our head of HCM. Um, you know, he's out as well, and and he's very he's been fantastic for the firm and, and very passionate around those topics as well. We all feel like we have the full backing of the firm to be really visible in this regard and 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 as I say, call out those behaviors, whether they're really overt or whether those micro, whether they're sort of those micro behaviors. Um and so look, it's an on it's an ongoing process, but I but I personally hope, you know, when I think about five to ten years' time. What's the, what's the dream? The dream is to have you know the most diverse um, the most diverse pool of talent that we can have working really collegiately in an inclusive way where everyone, as I said as I said a few times, just feels safe and comfortable and engaged and can be themselves. So that's what we're that's what we're really trying to achieve. And I think given the size of our firm and the profile of our firm within the finance industry, it's not just enough for us to do that amongst ourselves. I think we have to really take leadership of that both within the industry and 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 with our clients as well. Yeah, and no, I really 
some really good points there, Nick, really well said. I mean, um, one of the initiatives that we've been looking at just over the course of the last few weeks actually is preparing sort of a, a summary around um, the, the various uh, DNI networks that we have at GS and just an overview, sort of a one-page overview of, of what the firm offers and what the firm does and how important this is to us because we'd like to actually include that sort of in some, in some more of our, um, you know, marketing and, and presentation materials that go to our clients, say, within investment banking. Um, I, I've noticed over the course of my career that it's sort of diversity and inclusion is actually increasingly very important for the clients that we work with as well. Um, you know, I've been in meetings where we've had, say, four or five guys come along to the meeting and, and the client has actually called out, you know, the team's excellent, loved the content, but a little bit concerned about the fact that you've got no diversity yeah. in your team. Um, so we do receive those comments and I think it, it's really important for us that that we are, you know, um, putting forward, the, you know, creating the right impression that, that diversity and inclusion is critical for us and it's a really important part of our business. So having that sort of snapshot in there um, to, to make sure that, you know, that, that sort of clients are aware of everything that we're doing um, is something that we're looking at right now as well, so. Fantastic. Um, well, we're actually right on seven o'clock, 7.01 now. I think that's the end of it. There's no other questions from the audience. So it's been really lovely hearing from everybody. Likewise, Kevin. Likewise, we, you know, we've really enjoyed it, and hope hope those on the line have have have, um, have enjoyed it as well. But thanks so much for moderating the session. And as as I said at the start, we were we were super pleased and proud to be a part of it. And and thanks for organising it. Much appreciated. Yeah, thanks for sharing all your experiences. I think the students and young professionals here were really glad to hear about all the initiatives, the um, diversity at GS, and also the opportunities. So thanks everybody. And also thanks Catherine for putting all this together. Thanks, thanks very much. Everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.